Welcome to The Mountain Pass, a podcast about lifelong learning, curiosity, and our wonderful brain. Topics we love at Alp Audio. But this isn't a podcast about Alp the product. Rather, it's conversations driven by our curiosity. Today I'm talking to Liz Cohen. Liz is the head of marketing at Chetz Ventures. She comes with a long background in marketing, social media, branding, anything marketing related. But this conversation, we dove into her personal experience on the internet as an early user of social media, what that means to her, what a personal brand is and isn't, and how to use authenticity as your sounding board when being a person online. Enjoy. Liz, welcome to the Mountain Pass. It is great to have you here. It's great to be here. Well, we go a while back, uh, but for those who don't know you, why don't we start with your background? What's led you to where you are today? Um, Specifically kind of focusing on internet culture, and then we can just dive into all the different topics that we want to talk about. Sure, sure. Um, I guess... You could call me an elder millennial that might tell people everything they need to know, but it might not. So I will say that I got into where I am today by just being a person using the internet as it was becoming normal. Um, Chat rooms in the 90s, meeting people on the internet, then meeting them in person, which back then felt less sketchy. Um, And then eventually when leaving university and trying to navigate my way through a career, um, landed at a so-called high-tech company um, in Jerusalem called Answers.com. And that actually was sort of my real education. That's where I learned a lot about uh, user-generated content, guerrilla marketing, being a part of a community online, you know, under the, under the name of a brand, uh, managing communities, what it means to communicate online, et cetera. So I kind of really grew up in that, in that stage and um, grew up professionally, I mean, and ever since I've been working in startup worlds, namely on content, messaging, marketing, branding, all these sorts of words we use in my field um, for startups, whether very, very early or sort of a medium stage. Um, And then I also landed in the VC world about seven years ago. So I'm, I'm currently at a VC, an early stage VC in Tel Aviv. We focus on deep tech, enterprise tech. We're called Chetz Ventures. And, um, I'm an in-house, basically an in-house consultant for our portfolio when it comes to marketing and content. And I'm also, you know, running the content and marketing for the VC itself. Cool. So before we go into like the professional side of things, I was so curious why you think or why you felt the internet was less sketchy back then. Because Mm -hmm. my Mm -hmm. recollections, and I'm a few years younger, so maybe I was in a different place at the time, but my recollection of using early kind of AOL, ICQ, and I was big into mudding, which was like uh, massively open role-playing games that were Mm text-based. And those were sketchy as (laughs) deep, deep. So I'm really (laughs) curious why you think it was not sketchy. I'm sure there was plenty of sketchy. I mean, from the beginning of the time, I feel like humans have had their sketchy corners of society without a question. I'm sure the early, when I say early, I mean, I guess 90s uh, consumer internet was no different, but let's remember that I was about 15 when I started this, probably very, very naive. I, I should strike probably from that. And, you know, like we were, for the most part, and I'll call it the ASL days, like, yeah, there were sketchy ASL, you know, like people pretending to be kids. But my experience was that I was in chat rooms talking to people in high schools nearby, like a few of us met up and became friends. Like it's, it's, it was a time where if you didn't get caught up in the sketchy 
you know, spider web corners of it. I think it actually was a very flourishing, interesting, eye-opening time, at least for somebody, you know, I was a very curious and sort of um, optimistic teenager, I guess. So for me, it was like, whoa, suddenly there's a world that's been open to me where I can access things I couldn't access necessarily in real life. So, um, and I think that vibe only continues on and on to this day, but yes, like things definitely got darker without a question over time. So I guess, how do you think that impacted like being 15 and naive as a, in the early days and then kind of growing up with, you know, what we call today web two, especially mm-hmm. the social media side of things, because we're going to get into a discussion on branding and personal branding and social media plays a part in that. But how do you think that impacted your use of, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, because from what I see on your, you know, on your personal social, it's very different than what people would uh, consider, you know, classic personal branding. It's, it's really personal. It's really social um, in a way that kind of social media used to be when it first got started. Yeah. I think my, I think the truth is, is that growing up during a sort of, um, I don't know if I'd call it an evolution or a revolution or what, but like growing up at a time when there's active change going on around and you're, you're a part of it. And so, you know, I'm referring to social media being born. I mean, I think Mark Zuckerberg graduated a year before me from university. Like, you know, that this is my coming of age is, is all these other guys coming of age. So like, at the time, I think, I think a lot of these companies and, and social media for sure, it was all started with good intention or at least, you know, a positive uh, intention to actually bring the world closer, let people communicate, make communication better. I mean, I'm talking about 2004 and the following years, obviously today it's different, but we, you know, I grew up joining Facebook because literally it was for college graduates to stay connected. Like that was it. I was moving country and and it made sense. And so when you get in at the early stage of like a movement such as social media, I think there is a sort of um, innocence and well-meaning. And so Twitter, I like to say, you know, I joined Twitter pretty much, it was 2007. I think it started in 2007. And um when I talk to people who joined Twitter later or people who ask me about it today, it was an amazing, fun community back then. We made so many friends offline just by being online on Twitter, joking and talking and having real conversations about stuff. You know, you bring someone, you mention someone, suddenly you're meeting someone new online. Like even before Twitter and before Facebook, I was part of LiveJournal, which people don't talk about anymore because I think the way LiveJournal kind of ended was it was bought out by a Russian, some Russian company. So it kind of, I, I don't know if it still exists, but LiveJournal in 2004 was huge. I made real life friends from that. So, um, and for anyone who knows, no, LiveJournal was basically a blogging platform before, I, I don't even think blog was a word yet, but it was, uh, you know, you'd go on, you could have an anonymous username if you want. You could write about anything. You could lock posts so only your contact list could see it. I mean, it was like the early, early days. And so we we actually like networked for real back then. It was like very innocent and well-meaning. Take us take us actually back to that because today, and I, I guess specifically on Twitter, just because you described it just now and the vibe for me, Twitter is the kind of the social media that I use the most. And the vibe today is very, very different on Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah. Not only because of like the, you know, the shit posting or anything like that, but there's this trend of, of Twitter becoming, I'll call it a LinkedInification, where mm. you just have this large amount of experts and thought leaders who are out there on Twitter. Um, what was it like then? And like, why do you think that was? Why do you think it had a smaller vibe? Do you think it was because we, there were just less people on the platform, um, less notifications, uh, less media, less yeah. know, sophisticated. Like, wh- why do you think it was that way? So I'll say, obviously, I'm saying this as a user. I have no idea what was going on in the back end. But from what I can tell, it was it seemed very hyper localized back then. Like my Twitter feed, I was already living in Israel. My Twitter feed was mainly 
local Israeli slash Israeli Anglo English speakers who um, we pretty much all worked in tech. Like that was that was the people who were paying attention and joining. We all worked in techs in one way or another. And so um, it was kind of like this like funny underground cool way to talk to each other and then again like meet in person afterwards like that happened a lot we'd see each other at conferences suddenly we you know you used to put your twitter handle on your name tag to kind of like meet the people that you knew online or to catch up afterwards um so like i think it just felt really communal really local and also like back then how would you really find someone unless they were already in your contact list you know like you'd I think I think there was a way maybe to tap into your contacts or or find people you know and so like that was really it otherwise I don't I don't remember what the search function was like I don't remember the actual features but it wasn't like today where you could like search freely or have hashtags or whatever where like people were actually making it so you could find find them or they were you know doing their um personal branding or whatever so like it really felt hyper local and I would guess and I don't know this but so it would be interesting to hear this if like the the outgrowth of the hyper localness started because once there were like more issues brought up or news items or or weird you know happenings hyper locally that were that suddenly people were getting exposed to suddenly it became more journalists were joining you know all these like the the egyptian uh, revolution like all these different things the arab spring is what i mean so like all these things started coming up where the local suddenly blew up and became global and probably around that same time is when people were personal branding was becoming a thing i mean again i'm guessing but it would be interesting to kind of like really dive deeper into that my experience though in the beginning totally communal like totally local i wonder if it's just like a function of the people who got it, got it, you know, really the early adopters and they found their own tribe. Um, mm -hmm. the, I, um, I remember joining Twitter a few years later, I think it was in 2011 and just coming in and without an algorithmic feed of, you know, here are things that might be interesting for you, which I don't know if it existed back then. It's just being very boring because I also mm -hmm. don't know who to follow. Um, the flip side of not having an algorithmic feed is that you really get the feed of, of your tribe, right? Of the people right. who are around you. So maybe that's kind of the flip side of it. But going, I guess, down that algorithmic feed rabbit hole, today it is there and social media is out there. So last, last week I had a conversation with uh, Jesse Van Bruegel, who is he helps creators build their personal brand. And mm -hmm. one of his taglines on uh, uh, one of his blogs is, you know, personal branding isn't fun. It's like part of what you do these days. Um, <laughs> get, get over the fact that it's a fun thing or it's something you want to do. It's actually something that you have to do if you, if you want to take yourself seriously. What do you think about that whole trend? Yeah. Um... I think that there are people for whom this comes very naturally, this idea of putting yourself out there, of kind of always being on a stage. I mean, social media is essentially a stage and um, we can make of it what we want. We can be loud, we can be lurkers. I mean, our relationship to the stage probably is very similar online as it is off. But I think, um, I think that, that it's become work especially let's say you're a founder of a star of a certain kind of startup or um you know you're a, an exec of a certain type or you're looking for a following or or you're more of a publisher type and you want to follow or following that way like yes it's work and it's it's called personal branding and it's definitely there's there's formulas and there's strategies and there's ways to do this i think that um i think so many people joined social media later like you were saying before obviously there were those of us who just joined very early and and were hands-on because you're kind of action oriented when you join something like that early but the people who came later are less so and and they read they take they consume you know it's a different relationship to this um and so not everybody is like ready equipped or honestly literate internet literate or or we could call it even personal branding literate enough to do this or want to do this um so you have to take the reins there and i don't think it's for everyone um i think it very much depends on your personality and what you do and what your goal is how do you think about 
consulting with the startups uh, in your portfolio around this? Is, it, is this a topic that comes up? Is this something that you try and help them with? Or is it just a, a choose your own kind of adventure? I'll say for me personally, as like a B2C founder, it's, it's almost uh, reckless for me not to mm. try, <laughs> right? Like you have to yeah. try rise above the noise. One of the ways to do that is, you know, these platforms that we have, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is. Um, and if you, if you manage, it's very, very challenging, but if you manage, you can, it can be a huge boon and it feels reckless to me as a B2C founder, not to, not to attempt. Yeah. I think it comes down to one word and we're touching on topics here, like thought leadership and stuff. And basically it comes down to authenticity. I think that if as I'm thinking in terms of a founder now, if you're a person for whom this, this is something you want, this is natural, this feels right, this is who you are, you have a, you have a sort of knack for it, um, it's the air you breathe, just the important thing is you just be yourself, right? If this comes natural and this is what you want to do, you'll, you'll probably rock at it because you're going to put in the time and the effort and the voice and you understand who you're talking to. Um, if you're not forcing this is extremely hard. And I think, you know, how many PR companies and PR specialists have been approached and say that they do this where I'll, you know, I'll build your personal brand. We'll do it through managing your social media or whatever. We'll write articles and publish them in Forbes. Like this is very common amongst founders who, you know, think that this is important. They have to do this, blah, blah, blah. But if you're really being true to yourself, let's say you're a founder of a company that's developer first, okay? Their audience is really developers. Developers are kind of no bullshit. They just, you know, they want to get their hands on things. They want to try them. They don't want, you know, business speak. If you're, if you're a founder facing developers, be real. And if your realness is is having conversations and engaging in a community setting on the right platform where your audience is, that's amazing. Go for it. If you're going to, you know, build a Twitter persona because you think that's what you're supposed to do. First of all, it's really hard today. It's really, really hard to just get on Twitter and think you're going to do that, you know, in a few months and, and get a million followers or whatever. I mean, a million's even out of control at this point, but like, you need to be real about who you're talking to and who you are and how you speak to people. My thing in general, when it comes to this stuff is that it comes down to being, you know, knowing how to communicate, knowing how to communicate is knowing yourself is knowing the person you're talking to and knowing the right place and channel and way to be doing this. And if you think you can just kind of mix and match and it'll work out, it's not going to, that's not, that's not doing this type of communication and content with authenticity where it'll feel organic, it'll feel real. And we're at a point where I think people just, a lot of the people you're probably targeting will see through your bullshit. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about developers lately and developer marketing, because that's kind of the area I'm focused on. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we can make comparisons in different ways for different audiences. Is that one of the reasons why you've been less active kind of on that front yourself on social media? Like oh, I would say, yeah, like my thing, my thing on social media is, I don't know if it's, I think it's probably a lot personality and it also has a lot to do with how I started. So like I started on the internet, putting myself out there in a very real way. I'm going back to live journal days, early Facebook days, early Twitter days. Um, you know, I was me, I was me on the internet and like, other people I spoke to were too. And like, while maybe you don't put your darkest, you know, dirtiest secrets on there. And, and there was still an awareness that like, it's, it's public and anything could be screenshot. Um, which ironically, I feel like today, no one thinks about, uh, I think that like, it was easier to be more you because the internet felt smaller. Everything felt more localized, even if it wasn't localized geographically. I mean, you know, if you had the same interests on live journal, you built your little community around it and that was it. Like, it wasn't like somebody was going to, you know, report you or whatever, film you and put it on TikTok. Like, so I think for me, like growing up in that, that really spoke to who, who I am. I, I don't like to be fake. I can't really be fake. And I think that it, it, it's, I'm not saying people who are, who are doing this personal branding stuff are fake, but it's funny. I, 
a few months ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who also works in the same type of marketing that I do, the same sort of content, messaging, social media, et cetera. And he was lamenting kind of like, you know, we're, we're these introvert marketers and we're kind of like the people behind the scenes, you know, and, and we don't do all this like loud mouth, you know, um, megaphone type personal branding. Like when we write stuff, we mean it. When we, when we post something, it's, it's real. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Like, that's who we are. That's, that's a personality. Um, and it's both our regular everyday personality and professional personality. And that's okay. Cause I think there are, companies and brands and professional use cases where you know sort of a an all out there marketer is not the right fit because sometimes you find that the personal branding gets in the way i mean if you're all about yourself first which works i mean it works for some people if you're a consultant if you're pr if you're a certain type of marketer or content person that's fine but like not every company needs that or can use that um which is why i think the developer marketing area has become so interesting to me funny because the that the breed of marketer you're kind of talking about the one who who lives behind the scenes but works on content and not you know the performance marketing or things that really are behind the scenes because you've got facebook and google in the way it almost feels like a dying breed even though it really isn't um, <laughs> and, and that's just kind of my own personal bias or my own personal news feed which is heavily influenced by people who are active on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, right? That's who you see on social media. It's the people who are active. You don't see the people who are behind the scenes because, you know, they're behind the scenes. But what's what's interesting, I think, is you're kind of foregoing one of those powerful tools in your toolkit and kind of saying, you know what, this, this isn't me. Um, this isn't my gig. This isn't what I do, even though it can be really, really beneficial to what you do. Yeah, I'll say that I think a lot of it is about focus. So for example, what I've found is, um, is that there's a few topics I find myself talking about on repeat, let's say on LinkedIn, right? So like lately, there's a few areas where I, there, there are things I care about, there are things I'm working in or volunteering with or trying to feel out. And so I keep talking about those topics. And again, like I, I can't, I can't just, you know, post for the sake of posting. So when I'm posting something, it's because I'm looking for information or I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for reactions. I'm looking for someone to, to add on to what I said or whatever. And that's bringing me a ton of what I want, which is honestly not necessarily a thousand shares and, and a million likes, but I'm getting further in the causes that I'm pushing. So if it's you know, a private message behind the scenes or, or all of a sudden a new way to, to make an impact or put on an event or, or tap into a, you know, to another resource. Like, I think, I think it's really about getting to the, to the point and getting to what I'm trying to accomplish. And for me spending, you know, five hours a week working on what you want to hear from Liz or why you should follow Liz. is just not interesting. I think getting to the heart of what I'm trying to accomplish is, and I think the authenticity that comes with that is what attracts the exact right people I'm looking to talk to. So it is style and it is, you know, like, um, it's funny that like, what I'm hearing is like, you know, leaving on the table, this opportunity, whatever, but like, I think that would totally drain me and take me away from my end goals. If I spent most of my time, you know, focused on the follower count or how many times my stuff is reshared. So I'm okay with that because if I'm, if I'm moving forward and what I'm trying to do, um, that, that works for me. I will add for, for those of us who are behind the scenes doing this and, you know, for all the, the, the right hand men and women out there, um, I will say that I've I've worked on social media accounts and internet persona, you know, outlets for for various types of people and when you're in my professional position and you're working with someone who knows how to, you know, who has a really good voice and knows how to message and how to send the right, you know, the right communications and and I'm the person helping them do that, it is so much fun because I get to like help craft and amplify and put into effect and make real thoughts and ideas and, and conversations that this person might have, but this is not their day job. Um, so 
I actually find that to be a ton of fun. It's almost, it, it, I was about to say like story writing and I know everybody calls it storytelling, but like, um, but that's what it is. I get to actually craft the, the message and the person um, who's, who's out there on, on various platforms trying to get across what they're saying. I get that. I think my, my internal dissonance or pushback is really that. Uh, so I'm personally kind of an introvert. I don't really like doing social media on a regular basis. On the other hand, occasionally when I feel like I have something worthwhile to share, I want to share and I want people to read it because I think it's worthwhile. And then there's the, you know, like the business side of me, which is, yeah, I run a startup. I need to get customers. I need people to hear about what I'm working on. So I need that megaphone. And to get that message out, you actually have to be consistent. It's not something, at least for me, like I've never yeah. ever managed to go viral on anything. Um, and so like, you need to be consistent. You need to be working on it. So that's kind of this, you know, this dissonance that I, that I have going on in my mind. And then the other one is, is the main point we touched on, which is like authenticity, which is really, really important to me in a lot of ways. Uh, I think one of the main problems we have today with social media, the startup ecosystem in particular is the lack of authenticity and the lack of, I don't know, genuine, just genuine, real information. And what you see is always how, how, how green the grass is on the other side. All you read about is successful fundraises and it looks like everyone's doing really well, but we all know that that's covering up this huge, 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 huge pile of uh, imposter syndrome and people who are struggling to make ends meet and I think it would be so much more beneficial if we actually shared the lows as well as the highs, mm -hmm. um, you know, also just from a mental wellness point of view, but yeah. also from a business point of view, like there's a lot to share and lessons learned from failure just as much as from success. So I guess those are kind of two thoughts that came into my mind on the dissonance and, and the authenticity. Sure. Yeah. I just want to address the first point by saying, I think I, I agree. I think that, um, in the way things are today, if you're a founder, especially of a B2C type co consumer company, um, yeah, like like it helps if you or someone from your company, maybe it's not the CEO, maybe it's not the CTO, it could be someone else, is, you know, a voice, we used to call it evangelists, now they're, they're called advocates sometimes, but like having some person, some real person in the company as like a facing outward, you know, here's what's going on. Here's what we're thinking about. There's a real person. There's real people behind here. They work better than just a brand being on, on any kind of social. That's, that, that's true. And it makes sense with human nature. We'd rather talk to faces. We'd rather talk to people than a logo. Um, so I would say that like, as a company grows or, or maybe as a company is putting together their founding team, you know, and you're, you're thinking about the different personalities that, that come together for that. Um, yeah, like having someone on the team for whom this, this is this is natural, this is fun, like like in a real way, this will be something that they want to do will definitely help um, make that less of a sort of drag if it doesn't come naturally. But I also think, you know, like not everything has to be 100% organic and, and, and natural and free. Like, yeah, we're all putting putting out, you know, the the PR we just had or or the things that feel a little more, you know, okay, this is polished and we we did this, you know, we scheduled this in the calendar kind of thing. So like th there's definitely all sides to this coin. And I think as long as the human voice is underneath it, um, it helps. Um, by the way, I think social media uh, is not the only place to do this as a founder. Communities are a really, really big one. And I know it's hard, you know, Reddit, we've spoken about, it's hard to get in there if you're not there all the time, if you're not a person already that's just living in these platforms sometimes. But I think more and more we have to try to, um, we have to try to find the communities that make sense, whether it's some companies try building them from scratch, some companies try joining them, some companies try partnering with them. But there's something about like being in the place that's natural to you. And for some of us, it's not necessarily going to be Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, or TikTok, but it might actually be an old fashioned, you know, forum, community, whatever you want to call it, like where people interact and it feels natural and it's more um, closed, but you're talking to the right people. So that's, that's one thing that I would say to all the founders out there that are thinking about that. Um, the second question about authenticity, I have forgotten <laughs> what, what we were talking about. 
<laughs> oh, we could just take it from the top about being authentic in communication with them. Oh, right. And all the news and what we see. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Look, it's, it's a huge problem. Like I, I, <laughs> I think on a personal level, when we're when we're like uh, scrolling mindlessly at night before falling asleep or whatever we do through Instagram, whatever, and we're seeing all these pictures and whatever. Here's here's my take on this. It is 2022, basically. It's time to grow up, all of us. It's time to grow up. I'm not talking about 15 year old girls. I'm not talking about you know. I'm talking about the adults who have careers and we have lives and we pay our bills. It's time to grow up when it comes to social media. We know this is fake. We know that people are using filters. We know that we're putting, and I, maybe I, I can say this because I, I don't know, I, it's been so long or I'm an adult, I don't know. But like adults, it's time to grow up. So, so on a personal level, if it bothers you to see all these like polished, beautiful pictures of your friends on vacation, like you turn it off. Like, you know that, that their kid was crying in the background while they took that photo. Like, just stop it. And I think professionally, it's hard. I mean, it's really hard. Every time you open LinkedIn, there's another series A funding, you know, everything's great. Everyone's wearing the matching t-shirt and smiling. Like everything looks amazing, but come on. Like, I think, you know, being on the VC side and um, just having worked with companies over the years, even before I was in VC, just working with very early stage companies trying to build themselves, it's a mess. It's a total, it's always going to be a mess because startups are messy. And so I think I'm not, I'm not going to say professionally, okay, guys, it's time to grow up. But like, I do think staying focused um, and sort of embedding, you know, your own, whatever your own um, coping mechanism is for staying focused in what you're doing, sticking to your milestones, looking for inspiration, turn it off when it's too much. Um, because it's, I think deep down we all know that everything is messy and everything looks polished when you when you can choose what photo from the hundred you took to put on on social media, but um, but yeah, like if you if you want to get there, you better you better find your coping mechanism and stay focused because it's it's really easy to get swept up in all that you know, look what they're doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, so how do we? Because on the one hand. Yeah, it's all filters. It's all, uh, you know, angles and, and takes. On the other hand, like authenticity is what cuts garbage, right? Like I, I scroll through so much crap every single day. Um, but when I see someone sharing something authentic, that's what I care about. Uh, that's what mm -hmm. kind of forms that human connection. So like, how do we do that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's tough because not everybody wants to, you know, not everybody has the confidence to, to share a mistake they made or, or whatever. And it's funny, even uh, I'll even double down. There's this, uh, this is already a few years old, but, um, I heard it called broetry, like these LinkedIn posts that are very sort of like tech bros, like, like with their, you know, it, it's like couplets. And then they're just like talking about a challenge they had and the post just keeps going. And there's some sort of image that really like shows the post. And so, you, so yeah, it's called broetry apparently. So I, those things are, are trying to do this. They're like, oh, you know, I had it so hard. I quit my job or I, I hired this guy without actually interviewing him. And look what happened. Like they're trying to take something that seems bad and make it sound good. That's not this. That's not what you're talking talking about. And it's definitely not what I mean. I mean, like, you know, I, I started a startup and it fails, let's say, right. And I write, you know, what I learned from that, or, you know, this is terrible, but like, I found myself in debt. How did I get out of it? Like, how do I, you know, I screwed up with a thought leader and now they probably hate my company. Like there's all kinds of things that are very real that people could talk about. I think it takes a certain level of, um, of self-awareness of how to do it right. And you know, kind of self-assuredness that like, you know, you'll be okay if you're being honest and if it, if it fits who you're trying to attract and if it, if it still works to make the company seem human, but also growing and learning and evolving and, you know, on its way to success. Um, yeah, I agree that there should be more of it. It is hard. I, I do think it's hard. I think so. I think like anything else, it takes the the brand names, the leaders, the biggest, you know, voices in the industry to kind of set the path so that everybody else can kind of feel safe doing it. I talk about that a lot with other stuff. I talk about like sexual harassment in the workplace, et cetera, but like it really 
unfortunately does take like the bigger names to make this feel like it's okay and to to change the way you know we see these types of things interesting i wonder if it's kind of a luxury that we have when we're not on the line not to be authentic but to kind of be be able to control how often we want to post and what about and i'm coming at this kind of from a, a brand perspective where mm-hmm. you know we have our brand for alp audio we have you know me hoshua slavigorsky whatever brand that is um, both of those are very different and mm-hmm. from the alp side i'd say you know yes we have a branding playbook at the end of the day alp is a company it's there to tell you about alp right the features the articles the the value add that you get as a learner from using it it's authentic in the sense that like we're saying things we mean it's not human connection am i making sense here the which part is not the human connection like the as, brand yeah yeah as a company brand versus a person posting about right i did this i did that yeah I think I think it's true, which is why I think people prefer people in general. But but the th- but, but like it's worth stepping back and asking all of us, like anyone who's who's planning on promoting a brand or building a brand, et cetera. Like, what do you personally want from brands that you follow? Um, when you look at like generational trends and divides as far as like how generations um, interact on the internet and what they expect from things, you find that the the, the younger you go. Um, it's like, well, you know, I do, I I can and do feel loyal to a brand and I expect this, this, and this, and there are expectations. And sometimes that's like, for me personally, you know, I want brands to tell me about new features or give me, um, interesting use cases for how people are doing this. Maybe, maybe other users are submitting stuff and once in a while, sure. It's like funny to see like a, you know, a joke or a meme from a, from a brand, but like. What I expect from brands is information that's going to help me interact with them. That's me personally. And I think probably if you really like asked and polled, you'd probably find a lot of people feel that way. So it's important to just be aware again, like going back to earlier, my whole thing is really like know who you're talking to. Um, Cause if you don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna really be effective. So if, if the people you're talking to expect X, give them X and you can build on X, but like, if you really want them following and, and, and paying attention, then figure it out. Like maybe a brand is working so hard to build themselves on Twitter because that's what it seems like every other brand is doing in their space, but maybe that's not really the place to be for them. Maybe they can be more effective elsewhere. I mean, that's channel. That's also important. So be self-aware as a brand. Yeah, don't, don't send those Black Friday or Thanksgiving. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, I definitely know what you mean on that. So I, I guess I'm kind of closer to, to wrapping up, but when it comes to authenticity, and, you, and you've mentioned some tips already, but I kind of want to bring it together. As a content marketer, as a marketer in general, when it comes to being an authentic marketer, what would your kind of core principles be? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing is to always remember that you are a human talking to humans, even if they're technically users or, you know, whatever members or whatever you call them, downloaders, subscribers, they're people. And so something, an exercise that I like to do that I like to tell people to do is when you're planning a newsletter, an email campaign, a video, whatever you're planning to do in order to reach them, picture someone. I mean, picture someone real um, in your life while you're crafting this message. Um, it's stuff like that that I think will keep you on target to kind of, it's not just, you know, you know, in sort of like traditional marketing, you talk about personas and let's create this persona and we'll name it, or we could even choose a real person in our user base. But even calling it a persona, you're already taking away some of the like humanness of it. I would really just think about the actual people. They're sitting there at their desk and they're getting your email. What, what is going to make them actually respond or want to read it, et cetera. So I, I think thinking about people, your audience as, as human beings that you know, that are in your life and world is helpful. And then from there, you get to answer a lot of different questions that I think are critical. 
you know, what's the best way to reach other humans that you're trying to reach? Um, when is not a good time to be talking to them? Um, are you, you know, how much of what you're saying is fluff and how much is real and how do you parse through that and how, how important is it is that you do and what are they expecting of you? Like, there's a lot, this is a relationship. I think, you know, if you really want to tie it all together, going back to the early days of the internet, everything felt kind of connected. It felt like, you know, you felt seen, you felt heard a little bit more than now. Now it's just an ocean. And so if you really want to connect with people, then you've got to remember that they're people and think about it in terms of relationships, connecting, um, being true, being real to an extent. I, I would say that's like my, my real guiding light when it comes to this profession. Love it. So with that, I guess, where can people find you on social media <laughs> where you don't talk about these things all that much, but occasionally. <laughs> sure. <laughs> if you want to talk to me about these things on social media, which you're more than welcome to do, I have been on Twitter since 2007 with the name E-L-I-E-S-H-E-V-A, Elisheva. <laughs> um, and yeah, you can, you know, reach out. I'm so happy to talk about that. Th this goes back to it. I'm so happy to just have real conversations where I can build on ideas, change my opinions. Like that's, that's the early Twitter that I loved. So if you're, if you're up for that. Hey, what is, what is that changing your, I know, right. Again, it's 2022. What am I saying? <laughs> no, I, I, I am totally up for it. And I think there's more people like us too. And I think we're the people who, when the whole world has exploded in its nuclear glory, you know, we'll, we'll be in the cave still, still having real conversations on, on old school Twitter. Well, that's a, a great, great place to end it. Liz, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me.